Hello, this is Mrs. Brown from Research Triangle High School. The purpose of this presentation is to go over some of the details and analysis of the second half of Book 1 of Cry the Beloved Country. So we'll be talking about chapters 7 and 8 on up through the end of Book 1 in this presentation. And we start with chapter 8, where Kumalo begins his long journey into the city on the trail of his long-lost son here, Absalom. And the first thing we encounter is this bus boycott, and we see this as the reflection of some of the people's responses to the apartheid policies. Essentially, they're attempting to change it through non-violence, so they're going to start with the same kinds of techniques that we would see being used 20 years later in Montgomery, Alabama, for example. And we see that some of the white people are even helping out. They're trying to give rides because the blacks are trying not to ride the buses, but they're helping out by giving rides to people who have long distance distances to travel for work or to see their family. And some of these white people are even being harassed by the policemen for this attempt to help the blacks. We learn um, some of the background on some of the black political leaders, and we learn that there's three men who have really been influential in the politics in Johannesburg. One of them happens to be Stephen Kamalo's own brother, John, who's known as the voice or the mouth of the movement, Tomlinson, who's the brains, and then Dubala, the youngest, who's known as the heart of the movement. And this long walk that Kamala goes through the city with Missy Mongo from place to place asking after his son becomes this uh, symbol of this quest or this journey. And Alexandra becomes this ghetto-like place with this, um, it, it's so bad that the whites have even had a petition to completely abolish it, to basically throw it all down and, you know, burn it down to the ground. And where would the blacks go? Well, that's their problem, the, the whites are thinking. Um, and we see the language in this chapter, again, starting to really emphasize the importance of family connections. Notice Stephen Kamala almost never says, my nephew. He'll say, my brother's son. So everything is breaking that connection, that it's not just the separate person, but I have a brother I'm connected to, and then the son is connected to my brother, to show this, these family webs that are built up. Uh, Mrs. McKenzie becomes symbolic of a lot of the fear. Everything about her is she's afraid. She's afraid the boys have been doing something wrong. She um, is afraid that she'll get in trouble if she tells. But they're finally able to trace the boys back through the taxi driver, who starts to give them some clues about where Absalom might be and might have gone. And here's a scene from the Suero Ghetto of this is black on black crime, uh, just to show you just how bad things were getting in that particular day. Now, chapter nine may be one of the most confusing things you've ever read. The whole chapter becomes this kind of poem, um, like a song almost, to Shantytown. And you hear all these different voices. You notice that Petten doesn't use a lot of interesting quotation marks to tell you who's speaking. It's this sense that all of the people, like a Greek chorus, are coming up and having these conversations. And we learn these social problems that life out in the countryside, we saw this even with Stephen Kamalo, is broken. There's no jobs. There's been a drought. There's no food. So the people go into the city city to find work, but when they get to the city, there's this housing shortage. There's no place for people to live. And the system to get housing is corrupted. You have to pay bribes. You have to get on the government list. Sometimes it's a wait as long as six years to find a place to live. So what do you do? Well, a lot of people are rooming with strangers, and we see this kind of moral decline and family breakdown. You've got dangers when you're bringing in strangers into your home. There's more crime. There's rape of the um, of the younger girls. There's seduction. Alcohol gets brought in. People are have stolen from. And Shantytown, we learned, Dubala had this idea to build it right on the edge of the railway as a way to shame the whites. So as they were riding the rails every day, they would see all of these horrific cardboard boxes and pieces of scrap metal that folks have been faced to live in or forced to live in in the lack of the housing shortage. And at the very end of this, we get this God Safe Africa where the child that dies and we finally start following this one woman who has the child that they can't get to a doctor, they don't have any money, and the child starts to represent the whole countryside, what happens when you neglect it, and we get into the, the cry the beloved country sorts of thoughts into this chapter. So chapter 9 is worth paying attention to. It kind of stands out from the rest of the novel and has a very interesting significance to the rest of the book. Here's a picture of what Shantytown would have looked like on the edge of uh, Johannesburg. You can see all the, the laundry hanging out and the bits and pieces of metal that have been used and cardboard boxes put together just to form some sort of shelter from the elements.
Now, chapter 10 continues to follow Stephen Camalo, and we learn that he still hasn't really rebuilt this relationship to, with his sister, but he feels this really strong connection with the boy. It's almost like this chance to start over again. The, the boy is both a constant um, comfort because it reminds him of his own son, but it's also a painful reminder, the distress that he still doesn't know where his son is. So this search goes on through Chantytown. They try looking at the hospital. They learn that Absalom had gotten in trouble. He spent some time in a reformatory, kind of a kid's prison. We learn that he got um, taken out of the reformatory because his girlfriend got pregnant and so instead of having this opportunity to reform to change his life around he was sent out to help take care of this girl but he didn't take care of this girl he just left her and uh, Kamala does manage to find the girl who's very pregnant and she's just really a child herself and he feels both this awful combination of pity for this girl and then shame that his son did this to her that he got her pregnant then left her and has not stepped up to his duties to this girl or to the child that's going to be. Now, it's kind of interesting to contrast Stephen Kamala's reaction to the girl with Miss Mbangu, who perhaps is the first place we've really seen Miss Mbangu start to kind of lose it a bit. He has no patience with the girl. He sees her as just another one of these girls who could have done something different, and he says, perhaps you'll find another man, because he knows that, you know, one man might just be interchangeable for her with another. And then Kamala starts to realize, though, that he now has a connection with this girl, that this baby that she's having would be his grandchild. And then, even then, Miss Mbangu reminds him, you don't know that for sure. Are you sure this baby he's going to be Absalom's. And later, Miss Imago does apologize for his anger, his impatience, because he's just seen this story way too many times, and he has no more patience with it. And we see him uncharacteristically um, not show the kind of pity and kindness that we would have expected. Now, chapter 11 is another point of view shift. This represents a break from the storyline we're following with Kumalo, and we start to follow the storyline from the Jarvises. And you can start to see these two are on this collision track. So the newspapers are full of the story of this murder, this young white man um, who'd been a champion uh, for for justice for the blacks, um, who was trying to build schools and places that where they could be successful and help break this chain of crime, has been murdered. And we learned that um, there's some interesting connections. The Jarvis's big plantation is actually just outside of Kamalo's village, and Kamalo actually remembers seeing this small, young, he has him a small, bright boy, which would have been um, Arthur Jarvis, the little, um, as a little boy that Kamalo would have seen him. And once again, the author returns us to the same refrain that we've seen in a couple of the other, other earlier chapters, and that also gives us the title of the book, Cry the Beloved Country, These Things Are Not Yet at an End. And both Kamala and Missy Mongo seem depressed and hopeless. God seems no more to be about in the world, and the fact that this um, wonderful young young man who was actually trying to do something to help the plights of the blacks has been killed as um, part of the, the black crime problem that's been going on in Johannesburg. Now here's a picture of a young South African man with the passbook. The passbook was, think of like your passport, but you'd have to have it with you all the time. You couldn't go into a restaurant that somebody wouldn't ask you for the passbook. There are certain streets you couldn't cross into, and you had to be ready to produce this on demand, specifically on demand from a white person. So as an overview of book one, the, the whole novel has three different sections. So we're done with the first section here. We really start to see that book one is about the breakdown of the tribe and the family. Kamala and the others become disconnected from their family. We see this in the symbolicness of the train representing the separation from Dachshani into uh, the city of Johannesburg. We learn that the sister has gone a completely different direction, supported herself through crime and prostitution. The brother has gone another direction, and he's abandoned his religious values and become this political secular voice and we learn that his son has become a thief and has no honor he's abandoned this girl there's an illegitimate grandchild on the way and that the brother's child and his own nephew will lie about Absalom's role in this crime just in order to save themselves so a lot of this foreshadowing of crime and violence and apartheid the idea of separateness is now applying to the family and to the values so what is it that is separate in South Africa it's not just the policies but people become separated from their own ideals that they were raised with.
Another thing that runs through all of book one is this idea of fear. Everybody's afraid of something. Kamalo starts off the novel with worried thoughts. He gets the letter and he's afraid to open it. He's fearful of what it might say. Once such a thing is opened, it can't be undone. He's afraid of going into the city. In the city, the whites are afraid of the blacks and afraid of the possibility of crime. The whites even fear that there might be a big uprising, um, especially with speakers like John Kamalo getting everybody all, all riled up. Uh, the blacks fear the police retaliation so they don't feel any protection. Gertrude is afraid of Kamalo when he sees her, when she sees him again, that he's going to punish her and judge her. Kamalo's very much afraid for his son and what he's been doing. We learn that Absalom shot the gun because he was afraid. He shot the gun to begin without a fear. And we have this interesting conversation with the white priest where he's telling Kamalo that sorrow is better than fear. So how do you get through book one? How do you get over all of these fears? When you learn the truth, you might be sad, but sorrow is an arriving. Sorrow may enrich. So when you're still afraid, you don't know what's happening or what might happen, but when you finally, even if it's bad news, when you get sad, you now can begin to heal and to move forward and to do something and to learn something from that. So um, kind of a som somber book uh, at the end of book one, but um, sets the stage again for a lot of the things you're going to see by book three. And that's the end for this presentation.